All right. So this is the last session of the day. And the plan is basically so far if you have questions that have not got answered, then our hope is that we can ask these experts to help us answer those questions. Also, as you can see, there is one chair that is left empty. What's the purpose? Because we believe that people here can, are also equal experts who can come up here and answer those. So this is what is referred to as a fishbowl style panel, where typically one <coughs> chair has to be left empty at all times. So if there's a question from the audience, and if some of these guys answer the question, but let's say you're not satisfied, you think you can add something to this, then you come up, you take a chair, and you answer that. When you do that, one of these guys have to leave. <laughs> I might as well sit down now. <laughs> and then you can ask a question and come back on the stage. <laughs> All right? And just uh, to make it a little bit more interesting, we, are gonna, uh, we have three uh, echoes, echo dots to be given away. Uh, and like we publicized. Can I win? Can I win? <laughs> yes, if you are sitting down there. <laughs> And if the jury decides that that was really a good question. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know who the jury is, so I'm assuming we'll let people decide whose question was the best. Right? That's easy to just do crowdsource it. All right. So I'm going to kick off with the first question, and I don't get an echo for the first question. All right. So it's, it's, it's a fair game. Uh, I'm just going to kick off with the first question just to set the context and get the ball rolling. And then we'll open the floor for people to ask questions. Cool? For those of you who are sitting here, I don't think you can see any of these guys. There are a lot of empty chairs there. If you want to move there, that would be good. Quick escape. Like just let's see if these guys talk any sense or let's just escape out. All right. Cool. All right. That's a good suggestion. I assume that everyone knows all of these guys, but maybe it's worth doing a quick introduction. All right. Cool. Uh, we start here with Dr. Veena. Hi. I'm Veena Mandarada. I work at Nokia Bell Labs in uh, Chicago, and I work in the area of network reliability. Um, my specialty, I mean, I'm an operations research person. I don't do software or hardware but I do everything else. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Fabio. I'm a data scientist. I work for Racken Data Group and for OXO and for more companies out there. Uh, I love sharing my, my knowledge, learning from you, so you can learn from me then. And I create blogs, articles, webinars, stuff. So be active in the community. We, we want you there, all right? Hi, I'm Tom Starg. I'm the CEO of a, a consultancy company named AAA Quants, and uh, we do a lot of work on financial models, automated trading systems, and anything to do with um, automated automation and machine learning. Hi, I'm Arun Verma. I'm with Bloomberg in New York, uh, kind of in the same area as Tom, uh, in the area of quantitative finance. So as you know, finance is really a gold mine for, for high dimensional data. So it's a perfect place for, for data scientists to do their magic. So that's what we do at Bloomberg. Hi, everyone. I'm Dennis. I'm a research scientist at, in Australia at Australia's government research agency. And my team specializes on bringing the latest in distributed computing, Spark Hadoop, or cloud computing services like serverless to the life science area and thereby enable technologies or applications that just a couple of years ago have been thought impossible. Hello, everyone. My name is Seamus McGovern. I'm the founder of ODSC. Um, I used to be more of a software engineer than a data scientist. I uh, came out of the financial field. Um, I like to say now that ODSC has made me pretty dumb. The only thing I write, I don't write code anymore. I write Google Docs. Um, but, you know, my passion is growing the data science community, and it's uh, great to be here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Terry. Uh, I am CEO, founder, uh, 
of DeepCafa.ai. Uh, we build uh, AI solutions. Um, uh, we do research, and we also do philanthropy, uh, teaching people around the world who may or may not have the access or capital to learn. So those are the thing, three things we do. Thank you. Awesome. So hopefully, yeah, we got, got through a quick round of introduction. I'm going to start off with the first question, and then we'll open the floor. Uh, one more rule. Uh, whenever any question is asked, uh, at least two people on the panel have to take an opposite view of everybody else. Hi, Marsh, that won't be a problem. <laughs> Irish or Israelis won't have a problem with this. <laughs> Rest of you can figure it out, but uh, the, the idea is that we want different perspectives, right? If everyone's, yeah, 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 it's not, not great learning, right? So uh, at least two people have to take a different viewpoint, all right? All right, so the first question uh, for the panel, data science, AI, reality, hype. All right, if no one starts, is it? <laughs> I think it's definitely a reality. And I mean, coming from finance is actually interesting because it seems like data science in finance is, is definitely one of the much harder problems to solve. And so um, actually in my area, I would say it's probably still more on the hype side than on the reality side, although it's really tipping hands. over. <laughs> 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 he did both. He did both. No, we said someone else has to take an opposite stand. <laughs> oh my god, very <laughs> diplomatic. <laughs> All right, so um, leading on from that, definitely hype, oh my god. I mean, we've been doing the same thing for 10 years now, and now suddenly it's a you know, $100,000 extra on the salary and we call it data science. <laughs> and not that we're complaining, I mean. <laughs> but. I mean, seriously, the practices that we've been developing over the last couple of years is exactly what data science is, namely to curate good data sets, to um, clean them, to use machine learning or other statistical methods in order to analyze the data, and then get inferences from there. I agree. Seamus <laughs> <laughs> wants to disagree. <laughs> I have to pick a side, huh? <laughs> um, yeah. Most certainly the hype is running ahead of the reality. Um, as I think I mentioned in my open remarks, I was at the uh, Consumer Electronics Show in, in uh, Las Vegas. 140,000 people, like AI was literally everywhere. The, and now you have, just as Denise said, people doing analytics. Like there's a real difference between analytics and predictive analytics, right? Not even, forget about deep learning, machine learning. Like there's analytics um, that's you know, non-predictive. And people are calling like we have a predictive analytics marketing application, and and that stuff um, is going to come back and really bite people in the arse. It's giving the whole industry a bad reputation, um, and so the marketing departments, especially, are just running away with it. They're like going back to their engineering departments. Where can we stick the AI label <laughs> on this thing? Um, and I, I think it's going to create a bit of a, a backlash, especially when you start looking um, when you're applying. Um, data science and uh, AI across um, departments. Like, people are like, oh, HR, I can use this for, you know, figuring out um, how to screen resumes. Um, and the same with deep learning. Like, you know, there's, deep learning is fantastic for certain narrow sets of problems. You know, speech translation, image captioning, doing some good work in finance and time series. Um, but I'm always looking for, okay, sh show me the other example, show me the UK, because I, you know, I want to learn as well. I'm not quite seeing it, so you know, the deep learning hype is completely out of control. All right, that's my. So I think uh, data science is not uh, really not a reality yet, um, and AI has unfortunately sort of converged with media and reporting uh, pretty interesting things, and and also pretty kind of weird things uh, with robotics, and you have you know even sometimes eminent people. Um, talking about it in convoluted terms that makes it very difficult for people to understand. So either they go misunderstood and or comprehend that as hype. I think this is a serious problem. Uh, I, what, I, I really worry about it. I'm kind of concerned because 
So we're, you know, you're investing and you guys are putting so much effort in this. Uh, we should really educate the enterprises uh, uh, a lot on the applications and also be truthful and honest about the reality of the true application of data science in their business domains. And, and explaining a linear uh, sort of a projection that probably you could do with a simple SQL script uh, in your tabulated data uh, and sort of framing it as a data science solution probably is not a smart thing to do if you're a data scientist yourself or would like to believe. Um, I think it's important to report back on results so companies can scale. And uh, the whole idea of deep learning becoming a hype is people are not understanding it. So essentially, if you ask someone what is, can you describe what AI is, I think people start talking again in convoluted terms. So, so data science is not a reality yet, if you really ask me, if you want it to scale. And AI is, is unfortunately sort of kind of you know, turning into a hype, which we don't want. So, yeah, I was surprised that you said data science, AI in the same breath because <laughs> I think they're two different things. And now this, everybody pretends they're doing AI. So I'll address each of those separately. So even data science, I think there's a lot of interesting work, but deployment at scale is challenging. And I don't think it's happening as much as maybe we like to believe. And AI, I think, is just hype because everybody is doing AI now, and I don't think so. <laughs> so one, one final uh, thought. So I compare data science right now to what physics, uh, to physics in the 900s. If you think about it, when we were starting in the revolution of modern quantum mechanics and everything, it was a hype the back then. People did not believe it was gonna go. And there were so big people saying bad stuff about it the uh, good people saying good stuff that were wrong too. So uh, I think we're in the process of, of making this something very important. I think we're not quite there yet. I think we're in the process of making data science uh, an important and, and serious field. Right now it's, it's very wide, it's not well defined and stuff. So I, I, I think we're in, whether, if we follow the, the steps we're going right now, in a few years we're gonna have a good field to work in. So uh, just quickly, uh, I would say there are areas of data science which are definitely a reality and other areas which are a hype. For example, um, you know, looking at uh, some sort of uh, simple perception problems, you know, speech recognition or detection of, uh, of objects and images, I think is clearly the case is a reality. Um, um, you know, we, we can easily take large amount of high dimensional information and convert that into uh, something which is, which is easily understood. Um, but you know things like causality versus correlation, you know, uh, or inferencing; those things are really still very hard for machines to do. So you know, this is where like we have to make sure we keep it real uh, and not contribute to the hype by you know asking the right questions, asking for the scientific rigor. Um, um, you know, I believe as a discipline, it's a reality, and I think it's, it's here here to stay. Um, you know, some, some, in some areas we'll see, uh, unfortunately, a bust of the hype, uh, but where we'll end up will be at a much higher place than we ever were before. So uh, I'm definitely in favor of the, of the discipline. Okay. Can I just say one more thing? Um, I saw the um, um, workshop today with the Bayesian network guys from Mysore, and I was talking to them and they're saying, oh, not many people use this. And I, it's really interesting for financial applications. But they said, well, not many people use it. And I said, yeah, because it's difficult. And they said, exactly because it's difficult. And I think one of the things that we found is that a lot of these tools now are quite easy to use. So a lot of people use them. That creates the hype. But it's, it's, it's to a large extent because uh, it's just easy to access, but not necessarily that great. And I think that you know, when we really move to the more difficult things, it might actually quite quickly die down. And so it, I think it's worth considering as well. I mean, it's, it's technologically difficult, but it's actually, in, in a sense, quite easy at the moment. All right, in spirit of uh, time boxing, which we didn't do this time, but we'll do that next time because this was my question, right? Now for other people, we will time box things. Uh, so the floor is open now for others to ask questions. 
there are volunteers here who are going to walk around with the mics. So uh, what according to you would be the uh, most prominent uh, pain point of the society AI will solve in the near future? I, I'm biased. <laughs> Medicine, right? So with clinicians, currently it's a, if you have a good clinician, a knowledgeable clinician, they look at your data and they make the right decision what your disease or your treatment choice should be. But, you know, we know that there are different levels of um, skill sets out there in every discipline. Therefore, having AI as sort of a first step in order to make the recommendations and then for the human clinician to validate that um, that treatment or, or regime is probably going to be a game changer for everyone. Yeah, that's a really good question, by the way, because it's a difficult one to answer. Um, and I'm sitting here going, why am I drawing a blank? Um, and we actually run a data science for good focus area as part of a conference, so we usually have a half dozen or a dozen talks on AI for good, data science for good. Sorry to use the two interchangeably there, you know, AI and data science, but um, it's a hard one to answer because definitely I, I'm, I'm, I live in Boston now, a lot of great work going on there in medicine, drug research and things like that, but I'm thinking more of like single use cases. We have a talk coming up in San Francisco in a couple of months, a lady was using um, using deep learning to figure out, um, I think it was uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, how to get um, solar panels into what homes for people so they can charge a mobile device, which is a lifeline for them. So, you know, big wins, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's kind of hard in medicine, right? Because, you know, AI, deep learning is not a drug. It's a drug for some of you, it's a drug for me and you. <laughs> but for other people, it's not a drug per se. But I think there's a, there's a lot of small wins coming out by applying data science and engineering to a lot of small problems that kind of a big impact on people's lives. Um, I remember we had a talk a couple of years ago on um, using um, uh, predictive analytics, you know, not that advanced stuff, predictive analytics for um, helping people on diabetes better manage their treatment program and better patient outcomes. Like I know some of this stuff is small and incremental, but you know, that really makes a, a big impact on people's lives. and. Um, there's a company that just sold for a couple of billion dollars in Boston. I think CVS bought a pill pack. I believe they were doing um, data science just for simple things and making people take their drug regime on time and you know better patient outcomes, less entry in the hospital. So I see a lot of that. That's doing great stuff. So um, I, I think it would not solve what anything right now. I'm just playing the other part. <laughs> So I, I think we have a lot of hope on AI right now, but I don't think we are on the last step of AI right now. There's a lot of, of things to do. I mean, there's so much things that needs to happen so we can be in that space of, 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 of being in the AI world for real. And this has to do with the last question. I think a, a, a lot of companies think they're doing the AI and stuff and they're changing the world. And, and most of them are doing something good but I don't think they're solving root cause, root cause problems right now. So I, I think in the near future, we're gonna be seeing more stuff. I think deep learning will, will have something. Um, uh, I think we have, we're missing something right now. We have deep learning and deep reinforcement learning. There's something else to come that we don't know yet that will maybe be one of those uh, game changers for AI in the world. So I, I don't think we're there yet right now to solve everything. Well, we're in a good process right now. Sorry, Tom. Can, uh, sorry, Tom, I just yeah. want to add one thing. It just dawned on me, like, but things like Google Translate. Have you ever been to a country where you don't speak the language and you use Google Translate? Like, okay, it's not air chattering, but that, like some of these changes, you don't even notice they're happening. You kind of take them for granted, and then you figure out later, like, oh, I could have been lost without that. I would have survived, but, you know, sorry. All right. Um, can I also suggest the game changer could potentially be quantum computing? Um, and so obviously we're not quite there yet, but I can really see the potential in that. You and that? I, I, I'm, I'm an ex-physicist, so uh, <laughs> I, I totally believe that. I'm just saying this because I, I started, before going to data science, I tried quantum computing. <laughs> As you would. <laughs> 
And I mean, that was like 2011 something. We were, we were a lot of things that happening in that time for quantum computing. I think that's very far away right now for like doing data science on quantum computation and stuff. That's a long way to go. Right now, we, uh, I think that could be a game changer for, com uh, for, com for computation and power and stuff. But we're not, I mean, they are right now very far away. We, we, we have like quantum machine learning and stuff, but I, I don't see that many applications of it right now. But I think quantum computation could be a good thing, but I, I think it's far away right now. All right, Definitely I'm going to time box. Uh, sorry, right. we have a lot of people asking questions, so we'll let maybe only a couple of, of you to take a shot at it, right? First come, first serve. Yeah, so one mic at a time. Uh, hang on, Deepthi, hang on. One mic at a time, otherwise everyone will start speaking at the same time. Yeah, so uh, data science is totally based on the real world data. I'm, I will not say real application data, it's real world data, and the model which is coming out and the outcome data, maybe in terms of accumulation, accumulated data or in terms of any model or any kind of thing which is coming out, that is also a real picture of the thing which we can use to leverage the functionality um, in healthcare domain or in other domain, right? So, and AI as a layman language, uh, I'll say it's a technology. So, we all believe in technology. So, if we plug in, if we use that technology of AI, with the real data, then it means it will create an ideal scenario. So considering that situation, can we say uh, the future is uh, in future, uh, futuristic society or futuristic uh, world is going to be ideal, where everybody will be good, there is no bad, or it is going to face the same situation, but, but, but what is referred in the Terminator movie? <laughs> I don't think everybody is going to be good, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I I mean, I don't, yeah, maybe you're looking for too much from AI. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just actually, some, probably more of the opposite concerns with AI, which is like AI could have inherent biases and, uh, you know, we just learning patterns from the data which are rooted in, in, uh, in sort of maybe racial biases or, or, or other discrimination. And it's very difficult to train AI algorithms to, to, to forget those biases. Uh, so it's um, it's actually you know this, this is one of the much harder problem to solve. AI becoming good that's actually a very optimistic picture. People say the opposite. Yeah, there was there was a there's a book out. Well, I think it was last year. Weapons of Math Destruction, and in fact, there they talk about all the bad things that models can do, these biases and discrimination, all those kinds of things. So one has to be aware of those. I'm not supporting everything that was in the book, but I think they brought up some good points. Um, so I think from another perspective, it's uh, 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 let's try to think in preventive terms because uh, what we see, I counted in this uh, whole group right now, there are 12 women and probably majorities males. I think, I really think that, you know, we don't talk about ethical programming uh, as, as how, uh, you know, the uh, brains of our overqualified counterparts of our as males is, is not being uh, deployed. I really think an ethical programming would be a very interesting field in the future where we will program things that is taking care of how we develop things and, and I think that is the way we can stop it. I, I don't know how the society will evolve. I, I, I hope it will be for good. But I think uh, if we have a good distribution of women and men, then we will have a healthy discussion before you start writing algorithms. And because I really think that the world was created for both of us and all the other species, I still think the hugely male-dominant society is leading to a problem which I think we, we may not be able to explain in terms of algorithms if it is purely male-dominated. This is my personal approach. I, I don't know how it is gonna look like, um, but um, just kind of summarizing, um, I, I think it's not gonna be like Skynet. It, it could probably be that, that we actually self-destruct. So, and we, we have good experience with that, you know? I mean, we've been doing that quite often, every 300 years. I just hope that it doesn't happen. You know, it's something we hope 
I hope that we learn from the past. So it is kind of scary, but uh, I hope that we can control it by taking a preventive approach. All right, thanks. We'll move to the next. Hi, thanks a lot for the insightful session. Uh, just a quick question. So probably traditionally what used to have is we used to be very close to our code, emotionally attached to it and all. With the advent of the API errors, if you search for a problem statement, you'll get multiple APIs on your hand. Would you like to go with the API approach more? Or would you like to control your code and write your, yourself? Of course, you'll get uh, pros and cons are there. You can productionalize your system quickly with the API error. On the other hand, you can tweak, you can better control your system. So what's your thought on that? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of danger in um, So even though I was, I'm a huge proponent of APIs, love to build APIs, um, a lot of value in it. And, uh, but I, say, I think myself and Tom were really talking about this. Number of dangers, one is you don't want black box data science, right? We, we tried that in finance, didn't work too well. Um, a lot of issues around you know, black box models. Um, Another issue too was uh, when I was first starting my data science journey, I, was, I won't mention, but I was using some online APIs for uh, text analytics. And um, kind of a little bit going back to the uh, previous problem, but like if, you're, if you're working on data, assume your models are biased. Because by default, they have to be, because they're biased by the, the data set that they were built on. So bias is fine if you're working on a closed data set or something, but generally speaking, every single model you work on is biased to some degree because it's not an infinite data set. There's no such thing as an infinite data set. So yeah, APIs are extremely useful, but it depends, to me, it depends on what part of the, um, the chain you are. If you're an AI engineer like I was talking about and someone else has validated that API and the model and stuff like that, then it's safe. But if you're doing you know, critical mission stuff and you're reply, relying on somebody else's API and you don't understand the, the bias in the model and the, the model weaknesses and stuff like that, and you're going you're gonna to find them, but you're going to find them the hard way. So APIs are great, but you know, use with caution. There should be a warning label on them. I think there's no stopping this serverless. <laughs> Sharing of um, services, having APIs talk to you, or have the components talk to each other. And I think with with this whole movement to open source anyway, probably the black box thing is not you know, that big of an issue anymore. So I think for me it's, it's more this is, this is how I envision the future. Maybe I, I can't think of anything anymore once I've you know, been brainwashed into <laughs> that thought pattern. Um, but yeah, this is, this is to me the exciting bit where everyone in the world can write something and have a, be a component of a larger, of a larger bit. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a purist, and I, I like to not believe in APIs, but they're really convenient. So <laughs> it's, I, I can see them really coming, but I think it's actually really dangerous as well, because there's a lot of people that use these things. They don't really know what they're doing, uh, which is fair enough, because we can't know everything. But it can really lead to some problems, and I, I can really see this happening. Oh, thanks for taking the opposite stand. <laughs> All right. So I have a question here. We've talked lots about data, data science and all of that, which means that the data is being churned, worked upon and all of that. There's never a mention of privacy here. So how is that, I mean, how is that angle going to be handled? Will we have a session on that in the next um, Open Data Science Conference? Because with GDPR, California data, I mean, data protection, India coming up with its own data protection law and all of that, how are we going to handle it? We have data distributed all across. You just mix and match, people will be able to identify or will be able to pinpoint who it is, what it is, and all of that. It need not be Google, it need not be Facebook. Even a normal person will be able to do it when the data is distributed all across right now. How are we planning to handle that? Um, I mean, I don't know the technical aspects of how you would handle it, but I feel that like companies like Facebook they use our data, that's their product, they don't have anything else. So actually, uh, every user c should be paid for their data. They should make a choice. D do you want uh, you know, your data? You, they should bid for your data, and then you have a choice whether you want to give it. But of course, you are getting something for free. Like when I use Gmail, it's free, technically, but they read my email, and they give me ads on the side, so I'm getting something over there, 
but in general, I think they should bid for our data. Um, okay, so I guess I'm the only one from Europe here, technically. You left 16 years ago, so <laughs> that was before May 25th, where uh, in Europe the GDPR was implemented. You too? Ireland's in Europe. Ireland. <laughs> oh, we Ireland are. Exited, yeah. We have a Europe. Yeah, and I hope you don't, I'm please. Europe. No, I'm only joking. Yeah, so Ireland and, and Netherlands, we have lovely partnerships besides that we are super friendly for companies to come and establish in Ireland and the Netherlands, as you know. So if you have a company, you should come over. But again, uh, I digress. I think you have, you raised a very, very important point. So in GDP, I wrote an article some time ago. Uh, you, as an individual person, I, I, I wouldn't know the implications of being, uh, um, if you're in India or if you're uh, in US. So I think this nonchalant approach, so I'm disagreeing with you really vehemently um, that, <laughs> just to provide this, you know, the opposite poles, um, that you, you should know that if you are operating with any European company in, in any sort of secondary or tertiary way, your data has been used or consumed where European context has been uh, used, your company is liable for, and I, I guess I don't need to go into the details, of so 20% of the revenue and or X amount of uh, uh, millions of euros of fine. So that's a huge problem. I think the privacy is a very important thing. There is a clause 13 in GDPR that says that you need to be able to explain your algorithm if you are a machine learning department. So if any one of you are working with European companies, uh, you could have an auditor from Europe uh, reaching out to your sales office in Europe, which you may have planned to expand your company. They will come at your door. They're going to ask questions. If your machine learning department is not able to explain the algorithm, uh, for that one single person who have asked, who has asked this question, you're already in trouble. So I really think, and I definitely should be a very important issue uh, that needs to be addressed. So I think besides Europe, where we're at least trying to do some things, um, I think US and here in India and elsewhere, you know, I, I, it's just pretty sort of disturbing how data has been kind of just used. Uh, so I think we should pay attention to that. Yeah, and just really quickly, um, very good point, but we, we need more sessions around that because um, people think, oh, data ethics, like how hard can that be? But you know, you really have to think through data ethics because a lot of stuff you wouldn't realize um, are non-ethical. You know, the Ember en engineer may not think of, of these issues. And yeah, like <laughs> speaking of AI for bad, data science for bad, you know, a lot of the bad stuff coming out is going to be around privacy because, you know, governments are going to use this to manipulate your data, to manipulate your voting and stuff like that. So, you know, there's endless places where it's going to be used. So it's, it's a huge issue and it's going to become more and more of an issue as, as time goes on, for sure. So at Bloomberg, you know, we, we carry data from all our, our trading clients. So people have their portfolios uploaded to Bloomberg and also a lot of their trade ideas are going through our systems. So it's very, very critical for, for companies like Bloomberg to really take privacy very seriously. And you know, basically we essentially, unless they have given any sort of permission for us to use the data, we will not even touch it. And I know it's very difficult to kind of fully ensure uh, you know, within a close company, in Bloomberg we can do that, but in sort of more general uh, public data um, and uh, in other settings it's very hard to make sure. But you know, you know, with GDPR and with regulations, even in the U.S. and what's what happened with Facebook, and so on, I believe is is going to be very, very, very uh, crucial and taken care of. All right. Next question. Thank you. Hey. Good evening, everyone. So, I, you know, I notice a lot of hype and noise around, you know, preventing fake news uh, in research, but like, frankly, we're not even close when it comes to you know, production level or real time. So with elections coming in next year in India, do you think you know, a credible candidate is winning it or is, is it going to be you know, another failure of technology that will be winning the elections this time again? So what's another, what do you mean? No, what, what, what I mean to say is, you know, uh, though there's a lot of noise about fake news detection and stopping it in, in research, in real world, we still don't see it. And I'm saying with elections as early as next year, do we see a credible candidate winning it or a failure of technology or you know the candidate supported by technology and you know the technology not being able to stop spreading of these fake news winning it so you know i live in america there's no such thing as fake news there's, 
there's, supposedly, Rupert Giuliani said, there's, you know, there is no truth anymore. Truth isn't truth. So I can say whatever I want. <laughs> no. Yeah, we, we have some, we, we definitely have, um, no, we have, a, coming up in our U.S. conference, we have one on fake news, but, but I got to ask you, I'll ask you, you this question. What is fake news? Why is it fake? Some, one person's fake news is somebody else's entertainment, right? <laughs> like the National Enquirer has been around for 40 years. You go into any supermarket in America and it's there, like it's fake news. It's been around, like I think it's, it's you know, fake news has been around since the caveman. Hey, you see that, you know, that mammoth, woolly mammoth out there? <laughs> like, and that's the problem. It's like, it's, you're right, I, I, no, but I just, in seriousness, I know what you're saying, like, but it is a very hard problem to crack because, okay, there was a session yesterday on sarcasm, right? How do you detect sarcasm? A very difficult uh, NLP problem. And um, how do you detect fake news? And then in a place like America, which protects free speech, like, how do you, okay, I, I've identified it fake news, now what? So that's, so it's really, it's, it's not just about, and this is, and actually, just to rant on about this, because I'm going to rant now, it's like um, you're relying too much on technology. Like at some point, we've got to take, it's, it's a human element, you've got to take control. You want to do, do something about fake news, then do something about it. Don't rely on software or AI to solve it. Yeah, so in my mind, the way to handle this is really education, right? To teach the general public what is, how did it come about, what are bots, how do they influence us? What kind of um, you know, scope do they have? And I think some media outlets are doing a great job at that. And we just need to see more of it. So hello. So uh, with advancement of AI, life of human will be more beautiful. I agree to it. But on another hand, there are many people who are doing some skilled work, skilled labor, or they are doing some manual work just like a driver or a person who is not technical guy but as a work, working as a labor in some industry so their jobs will be in danger definitely because with advancement of ai some machine will able to do that job so as a data scientist how we are going to solve that problem because on one side we are making the life of human much more beautiful but because of that on another side jobs of some human which are not data scientists and which are not technical guys, they are, are, are common people from society, their jobs will be definitely in danger. So as a data scientist, what are our approaches to solve those problems? Um, I think you raised a very good question. Um, um, the only way to solve this is to ensure that the, the startups or companies or the expansion and inclusion of technology that is there in machine learning and or deep learning systems should ensure that it is enabling uh, employment. And there are ways to do it. I can give you an example. I was, uh, last week I was in London uh, uh, mentoring around 40 startups who were actually focusing on, uh, the, the theme is energy, but it's for social good. So in this case, there's Vietnamese uh, farmers who were, um, who have this problem of drying of rice. And, and so essentially the nature is unpredictable. It rains all over the time. They don't have the drying facility to dry rice. And it's a havoc in the life of a farmer because he is essentially not sleeping because you know they hear the thunderstorms and they have to rush or try to cover. So it's really panic stations there. So there was one startup, they had came up with a solution in which they had this you know, hardware, a, a device in which, you know, a, a real appliance in which you could you know, funnel the rice and it dries the rice using solar energy and essentially stores the rice for the farmer in a way that the farmers can start doing easy stuff as in they can continue farming. Uh, they also propose the concept of microfinancing slash even, even potentially proposing a rice bank. I thought that was great because this is gonna enable farmers. It's not gonna just deplete farmers and you do some, you know. So the whole idea, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the whole idea of trying to use drones and we're gonna farm is we should not kind of get into that. And the try to use technologies and use of technologies and enabling these, making predictions and understanding how you can farm rice, dry them. As you know, most of you would know, the, the, the older the rice is, the more price point it has. So those are the things in which the farmers can actually potentially going from a disastrous situation of drying rice and oh my God, my whole year's crop is gone because it rained again. 
they become profitable and, and using AI or, or should be using AI, using deep or machine learning solutions, they can inform themselves of you know, the, the equity they have with that rice, which was essentially being sort of mon monopolized with, with others you know, their own villages. They have now visibility into the asset that they have. So I think, <clears throat> and there were 40 other stories I can tell, but we don't have time for that. So I think creating uh, and, and embedding these deep learning or machine learning solutions to enable these people to actually encourage agriculture, getting more people getting back into farming, is going to actually increase that you know uh, people in those areas and solve a lot of other problems like urbanization, et cetera, that we all suffer. That's why Mumbai and, and Bangalore and, and other places in the world get overcrowded. So I think there are a lot of things. So I think it, we need to give it a thought and try to you know encourage each other to start uh, 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 startups that focus on solving these problems at the community level for that human being, and that's really going to help. Yeah, it's a, a great question. Uh, you know, the same concerns were raised uh, you know back in the time of industrial revolution, maybe like in the 19th century when we had like trains. Uh, invented and electricity and cars and people were worried like they're going to lose their jobs uh, but what happened was really people really bec became more productive like uh, the technology enabled them to become more productive not really lose that many jobs in fact they moved on to doing more sort of higher level jobs became doctors or engineers or um, more like thinkers and, and stuff like that um, as Terry was saying you know it's essentially sort of enables them to be even more productive um, and uh, potentially find you know be better kind of profession or you know education. Education definitely is a concern, but you know we can move on to become sort of more intellectuals or thinkers uh, if technology is enabling us to do sort of more most of the operational work very well. Yeah, um, you need to kick me off the stage soon because I keep talking. Um, I don't about yeah, I think I, <laughs> I think there's yeah. This is a lot of discussion around this is really bad. Because um, I remember after the financial crisis, I'm back in Ireland. Ireland had a huge building boom, and um, they were building like 100,000 houses when the only demand was for 10. And all of a sudden, everyone in the construction industry was laid off. And the government minister came on and said, we're going to convert all these carpenters and laborers into software engineers. I'm like, complete freaking bullshit. Like, not everyone in the future is going to be able to come, because the problem is, you see it in the States a lot. You have these low-skilled jobs, and then you have upskilled jobs, and a lot of wealth is transferring to the upskilled jobs, and that's great for those people who do it, but the people who can't do these jobs, you can't just simply upskill everybody, especially in their lifetime. You know, and that's what's scary, and I'm pretty passionate about this. I, I really think this is where you know, government needs to come to events like this. They need to understand data science, machine learning, AI, and they just need to get involved because at the end of the day, I know it's like a, like, again, technology's not going to start, start with everything, but they need to kind of step in here and figure out, get ahead of this problem, because it's going to be a huge problem. All right, we are out of time. <laughs> we will take one last question, and we'll go to the lady over there, just to make sure that. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Next conference. <laughs> um, I might as well stand down. Hi, so um, I saw Sophia. Uh, do you believe that, first of all, uh, do you like her? And uh, if yes, do you think that sh we need more Sophias in this world? Okay. So, uh, first of all, if you. Uh, research about Sophia, uh, when she comes to a place, people need to give the authors the questions beforehand. <laughs> She's not answering everything you want. And they reply to you with some approved questions. And you can only ask her those questions. So that's one example of a huge hype on, on AI, because we think that this is a human thinking machine that is answering everything we want, and this is funny, is everything, and I think it's a huge advance. Uh, it's, it's a huge advance in technology and something looking like a human being stuff, 
And um, there's no way to stop that. I think we will be seeing more humanoids in the future. Uh, hopefully, they will be more intelligent. And so I think right now we're not there yet. So, so Sophia is not uh, that, that machine we think she is. Uh, but I mean, I like her. Uh, I, I watch some of her videos, and they're, they're interesting and stuff. And, and I think it's, it's, it's inspiring to people who can actually create these systems for real. So I think it's a, it's, it's a good thing that, that she's there inspiring other uh, researchers and engineers to create this, this new thing that will be helping more people and, and, and actually uh, being a part of society because that will be a thing. I mean, we're, we're not thinking on it, but in, in some years, these humanoids will, will be part of, of, of society. They, will, they can help us. They will be able to do some things for us. So uh, it's, it's better so we take that we take them seriously because there's no way to stop them. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm going to say really bad things. I think it's the most stupidest thing that you, uh, you've seen on the internet. And I, it's the most, has anybody seen Sophia walk? You want me to do the imitation here? <laughs> Let, really, do you want it? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. So this is how she's walking. And you know, Boston Dynamics, they're laughing their asses off. <laughs> this is Sophia. I mean, I really think um, I'll take uh, probably some, uh, some kind of AI drug. So I think, uh, I really think, I really, really think hands on robotics and the gentleman who's investing millions of dollars, if he puts seed money into those 25 to 30 to 50 startups to really solve this problem with sale, I think we would be in a much better place. It's really unfortunate that you know, people are investing in it. Uh, please do not actually, <laughs> I would encourage you to not ask a question and not give this weird mechanical uh, object with ultimate stupidity any kind of attention. I really think so, because I think your job is to, to develop systems, and the next time you come to ODSC, you're probably creating uh, a simple robotic feature that helps elderly who are especially, you know, falling off in, in the bathrooms and, make, uh, you know, having hip fractures. And those are the things that can really help you kind of pe do really interesting robotic things. You know, having some stupid, ridiculous, dumbass robot <laughs> is, not, is, not, is not what we want. We don't need, we have like, what, 9 billion people by 2050? There's a lot of potential. <laughs> and I'd love to see a, you know, beautiful woman walk and with, with this, you know, and Sophia was kind of, yeah, probably drugged. <laughs> Sorry for the French. All right, we've killed it. <laughs> <laughs> last, last one. All right, I think we should uh, give her the last question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Special want to question, thank you. Cursed. Yeah, actually, <laughs> I want to change the dimension completely and then ask a different question. Let's see, I'm seeing this. Um, discussions from a business perspective. From the business perspective, at the end of the day, I want to make more money. The data science problem I'm solving, or AI problem, or whatever it is, what model I'm creating, doesn't matter, I want to make money. So money, how will I get? It's not only by proving I solve the problem by a POC, I want to replicate it and scale it wherever I could, as fast as I could, and automate it so that I can make more money. So if I'm leading an analytics department, the more scariest thing is the landscape is keep on changing. By the time I make more money or make it stabilized, the landscape is changing. I'm not saying it's wrong, but uh, after the landscape change, it's much faster and smarter. So I can't ignore as well. So especially the question is for CEOs, what is your perspective around it? And if a person is leading an analytics team, what kind of advice you will give to that person? I think, uh, well, it's actually a really interesting question in a sense that in finance is exactly what happens all the time. The landscape is just changing. And, and while you're actually deploying the systems, by the very nature of it, the landscape is changing. And it's changing much faster than it did even three years ago. And a lot of people really struggle with that, especially people that have traditionally been really successful. They're suddenly not successful anymore. And I think... And, and it's, it's, it's really interesting to see how the people react. And some people will, will really not, not, be, not be able to keep up with, with this uh, future pace. 
And, and other people, they just jump on the bandwagon and somehow get through it. What I notice is, and, and also for myself working in this, there is no easy answer. The, the, the only thing is you can just hold on for dear life, like in, in Mumbai when they hold on to the trains and just trying not to fall off. Um, and, and, and really this is, I, can, I cannot, it's, it's evolution. It's, it's just we, we are, as humans, not fully evolved, right? Evolution keeps going, keeps going, and, and there's no way for us to, to stop that, and, and no government can do that, no anyone. And, and I think we, what we're here seeing is, is evolution, right? And um, I, I don't think there is an easy answer, if, if any answer at all, actually. I think the, the uh, or at least I, so I'm a CEO of my own firm and actually heading two more firms that we're launching, and I work with chief executives and chairman of companies between 25 to about $50 billion uh, capital uh, in, uh, revenues. So what I tell them is, yes, it is a changing landscape. The best way, and you're seeing it already, right? So the, th the way things like you know fast and agile and pivoting also in your projects and creating a sort of minimal viable projects for solving sort of uh, problems, you already see actually if you are working with larger enterprises that the budgeting cycles around the period of November, October, November, when you would you would essentially agree working with procurement that well this is where the budgets are. You should you know eat your budgets for this last you know past three, three quarters. That's changed. Basically, it's on-demand basis in enterprises, the ones at least I work with. For example, uh, a CEO, a banker, a German banker who's now CEO of a large um, manufacturing company in, in, in the south of Germany. So, so he asked me the question, so well, how, how can we get more competitive? I said, you can do you know, kind of you know, basic and intermediate stuff. You can also do advanced things, like you know, if, you wanna, you know, if you're manufacturing ball bearings, if you can use advanced uh, machine learning and, and start using it and, and applying it to material sciences to all this, you know, the ball bearings that you create, you can also develop new allo alloys. I mean, that's not something new. But the only thing is you can, with much better position, uh, you can actually go to new markets. Uh, for instance, if you're, you know, serving ball bearings in, in Doha or Dubai or even Mumbai, the wear and tear of your machines and the product is, is much higher. So you need to develop or, and even come up with a new alloy. So that's really kind of breakneck speed. And probably there, you can sustain your margins. Mm -hmm. um, on the basic and the intermediate, you will be caught up with the, you, you, the competition catches up with you. And obviously, the invention of, and, and the evolution of deep learning can overwhelm you. So I think you, I would suggest enterprises is to place their bets in the basic, the little projects, low-hanging fruits, um, and, and a little bit in in, in your intermediate project with some volume and have at least one or two sort of big bang for bucks slash, you know, BHAG, you know, big hairy uh, goals uh, in order to kind of, you know, have your, uh, to get a gain competitive edge. And it seems to work with a few and, and you tend to get, you know, it's a matrix organization you should realize for bigger companies. So one of the chairman of, of the companies I work with has himself given a lecture of machine learning uh, to his thousands of employees. Uh, the other uh, are kind of teaming up with even unconventional companies like Tencent and Tesla and learning from them. So I think I would suggest those kind of strategies in order to sustain your margins and continue to be uh, profitable. Yeah, just, just a quick word on that, quick word on that um, I think it comes down to execution, right? Execution is everything in business. And um, really keep an eye on the, you know, what's exciting for the data science landscape for me at, right at this moment is um, a thing called data ops. So data ops came out of the, not so much data science, but data. But keep an eye on data ops and things like Kubernetes because um, the, the life cycle of a data science project is getting quicker and quicker. Um, we were using things like typical rendezvous in, in finance 15 years ago and all of a sudden like streaming analytics is big now. But it depends on, um, and maybe not getting real time data, but also, you know, I, I speak to a lot of data scientists and I talk about model deprecation. Because again, coming on finance, you, you, you actually knew your model needed a shelf life. And people are just been, oh yeah, I've been running this churn detection model for the last three years and not doing it as well anymore. I'm like, three years? <laughs> are you kidding me? You gotta refresh it. So when I say execution, like look at the data science workflow and a lot of smart companies, they're figuring out, okay, we're gonna use AI engineering here. We're gonna use the best of breed infrastructure. We're gonna understand, we're gonna, like, thinking about just, you don't just put your models into production, right? You're always looking to validate them. You do model monitoring. That's where I was trying to get that point across very quickly. Yesterday I was talking about it like, 
there's so much potential here in, in, in data science for data engineering, you know, or AI engineering, whatever you want to call it, because just, just having people who know how to model the monitors, know when they're deprecating, know when it's time to swap them out, hot, like how do you do a hot swap of a model? Like the thing can't even be down for a few minutes if it's a pricing model or an auction model or something like that. So a lot of it comes down to having a really good, if I was giving advice to a CEO, like it comes down to people, you're, you know, you can hire one very smart person with a PhD from MIT or one of the ITTs here or whatever, but really you need a team of people who know what they're doing, doing and you need, you need the data science department and the IT department to kind of work together. That's why we kind of need these AI engineers and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I'm a firm believer in that. Thank you. One last word. So uh, I think what Seamus said is, is, is so true. And being a data scientist, combining data ops with innovation and an agile framework for working, I think is the best so you can stay up to date every time. And this means being able to ship intermediate results. I mean, you're, if you wait for a project to be finished, to be able to send it to the market, it's so late now. So you need an agile process it's, so it can be fast. It can be, you need a systematic way of doing things fast. And it's the only way you can uh, like, uh, make that time to market period short and you can uh, uh, follow along uh, with the whole company and for that you need a good team, you need good people and a good process. I mean, if you have good people but you, have a, but you don't have a good process, you're doomed. All right, that's good words to stop the conference. You are doomed. doomed. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, I would appreciate everyone on the panel for staying with us and keeping holding back so many people. Not many people escaped out, which is a good <laughs> sign. So now I'd request the panel to identify three people who gave you the hardest time. Three questions. I like, I like the last one, question. What if someone even had a harder question? Agile, right? You have to be first to market. <laughs> I think the three questions I liked, just myself, the gentleman over there who asked the, the first question, um, the data science for a good one and the privacy one. Yeah. I yeah. like those three. For me, it was the uh, last one. I like the privacy question. And I like the one, uh, the, the, the first question about the what would change. I, first question. Not, not the, the, the one about uh, the pain points and how AI will solve them. I think you, you said it, right? Yeah. yeah. You guys? I, I tend to agree with the three, the business, the privacy, and the uh, AI question. All right, so we have winners. Yes. Cool. And right. my... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Do we have? Thank you. Privacy. This is dangerous for privacy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. I would like to have Shemus uh, share the last few words about uh, the conference, the community. Yeah, so um, I got to say again, um, actually, I don't know what to say. Um, for once, <laughs> somebody asked me a question quick. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm been, I got to admit, I'm, I've been pretty blown away by uh, ODSC India and what, what the rest has done here. And um, I've said this a few times before, we've had conferences in different countries around the world. That's one of the great funds of being involved in ODSC and being invited to other conferences. And um, I've been really blown away here because, um, you know, thanks to all of our wonderful speak speakers and the other ones who are not here, um, they're really what I call debate, right? They're debate. Um, you guys are what make a conference. You could go at home, you could be on Coursera, you could learn this stuff here, but you come here to listen to their insights. But it's bringing this community together which makes this event so great. And I'm sure you've had those experiences speaking to each other. And um, ODSC, as I kind of mentioned briefly yesterday, we started from a meetup, right? I, I love the whole idea of meetup, um, this free, open exchange of ideas, open talk format. And um, this year, you know, we've been, we've been around four years. This year should be our first profitable year, finally. 
Um, as Naresh said, this stuff is a bit of an expensive hobby. Um, but you know, one of the ways we're giving back to the AI community, um, we gave some money to Chainer, Python thing. We gave some money to um, AI for a good um, cancer research in Boston. We've got another award coming up. So we do have a grant award, by the way, on our website. So if you look up ODSC grant, um, we're doing scholarship tickets. But I really kind of want to go back to my roots of, of doing Meetup. Um, so you know, one of the things, I'm going to stand this stage next year, and I want to have at least six Meetups running in India. Because again, you know, a lot of people can't afford to come to conferences. So if we're going to be true to our goals and our ideals, I want to start running, um, do more meetups here in, in, in India. And, and not, not in the sense that, oh, you're like, oh, great, one more meetup, that's all we need. No, just to work with other local organizations, other meetups. So if you guys are interested in helping ODSC and volunteering, you know, we'll hire a resource, we'll get, get support for you. But we'd love to start meetups here because one thing I hate is um, these conferences are just blow into town make a lot of noise and they're gone in two days and that's it. You know, with data science, as you guys know, there's lots of challenges, there's lots of opportunities. We just want to be in the mix, like, as I always say, um, you know the slogans in the back of the t-shirt, the future of AI is here. ODSC is not the future of AI. I'm not the future of AI. You guys are the future of AI. And, you know, as they say in the agile process, we just want to be the facilitators of that as this, and, as, and it's, you know, it's, it's great fun. It's, it's wonderful stuff. So, you know, once again, Thanks, Naresh, for organizing this. You did a fantastic job. I got to give you a good It's just not yeah. me, the lot of volunteers, and the, a lot of and people. The, yeah, that sorry, when I, when I thank you, I'm really thanking the volunteers because I know yeah, it you guys did work. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, ODSC, you know, ODSC is a little kind of a, it can be a rough organization. He's he's putting us to shame, like sending drivers to pick up speakers and stuff like that. <laughs> No, you do you do, you do stuff better than we even do it. Um, but again, thank you to all the speakers. Speakers, I got amazing feedback from all the talks, and that's what ODSC is about. Because we would never be growing like we are if it wasn't for the speakers and the quality of the speakers. And it takes a lot of effort to put these talks together, to travel for three days, and all that. So <laughs> thanks to the speakers again. Thank you. Yeah, so Naresh, I will ask you um, maybe at some point, I know you're going to go home and sleep for a week, but we'll send an email. So if you want to get in contact with me, we'll send an email to all attendees to contact me back about the meetup stuff. But the last people I want to thank is you, the audience, because again, you guys make the conference. So thank you for coming. Thank you for investing your time. And effort. Thank you. We, we're going to be sending out an email where, uh, you know, we, we like, in the beginning, I said we don't do feedback forms. That was more, you know, like we don't do feedback forms during the conference where you're kind of filling in some stuff. But when the conference is over, we do want you to like sit back and think about, you know, what was valuable to you, what kind of speakers you really liked, what topics you liked. If we were to do this again, what should we focus on, what should we improve? So we'll kind of try and give that. Uh, and hopefully there's constructive feedback which basically helps overall uh, the conference to improve. So uh, you would be getting shortly an email uh, which will have some of these uh, details for you to fill out, uh, which will basically, it'll again be all public, so uh, watch what you fill in there. Uh, I, the reason I mentioned that is not to discourage you from filling bad feedback, we actually appreciate that, but just watch out in terms of the language you use because whatever you fill in is gonna be publicly visible to everyone. All right, uh, so that's, uh, that's the feedback that's going to happen after the conference. And like Ashimu said, uh, if you're interested in uh, running a community, then uh, please contact uh, any one of us, and we'd be happy to kind of see how we can facilitate that. Any other questions you guys had? about open data. I think apart from one session, most of the sessions were about data science. Uh, and so maybe if we can do more or I don't know. Uh, we are seeing that as data science is being open, data is getting closed. People are thinking it's a gold mine. So maybe more sessions and more interaction on that. So it's interesting, uh, the name open data science. It's a, it's a uh, more there are four different interpretations of that <laughs> name. <laughs> So we had companies reaching out to us saying, we want to present at this conference, but we don't have any open source, so we are not going to be presenting at the conference. 
uh, we had people approaching us saying it's it's about open stuff. So you know, only if everything is open, then we can present. <laughs> then we had people who were saying open data, which is you know just like about open data. And we we in fact we had a panel that was planned for today, uh, which was about uh, open government data. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the person who had originally written the paper could not make it, so we had to change the panel. But anyway, the point I was trying to make is there's a lot of different interpretations of what open data science conference means, but you have a valid point that we need to include more topics on uh, open data in general and some of the privacy concerns and stuff like that associated with that. A uh, code jam? All right, so you're volunteering to run a code jam next year? <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. You got it on the camera. <laughs> So this is all uh, completely volunteer driven. Uh, when, so when we announced the conference, we also uh, called for an open uh, program committee, open program committee as in truly open program committee. Uh, so a lot of people actually at this uh, conference who've organized this conference, I've met for the first time in my life, right? And that's because there's an open submission system through which people come in and put their name saying, hey, I want to be part of the program committee. And Basically, our philosophy is to accept everyone. So there were about, th about 33 people who, uh, who came in. Uh, we accepted all the 33 people. Uh, as time passed by, a bunch of them were completely inactive, so they get dropped off. And then I think we were left with uh, 14 people or 16 people. I don't remember the final count. Uh, so the point I was trying to make is that if you uh, if you want to contribute to this conference, it's, it's an open submission process. You can come and submit, and then you, know, you can take that. The second way is basically we also do open submissions for the talks itself. So a lot of speakers who have come here uh, have actually gone through our open submission system where they can go and nominate a topic. Uh, so again, you know, like I want to run uh, this particular thing or I want to do this particular thing could be a great submission in, in this process, and that's how uh, we could get uh, selected, right? So I'm just trying to hint how you could contribute and how you could get involved because quite a few people were asking about that. So the, it's, all, it's all a community-driven conference and people can uh, come in. So whenever we announce the next conference, watch out for uh, call for program committee, call for proposals, various different ways in which you can involve and influence the program, all right? There's also a voting thing, all of this bunch of different options through which you can influence what gets into the program. All right, I think uh, it's been a long uh, two days for you guys, a uh, long three months for us. Uh, so we're going to call it a day. Uh, thank you again. As Shemu said, uh, for me, the success of a conference is not what a great speaker lineup we had, but the success of a conference is what a great attendees we had who, you know, many speakers said the quality of the attendees was really high, right? That's what makes us happy. So thank you for coming to the conference and keeping that engagement really high, keeping that curiosity really high. Thank you very much. Of course, we do need to thank our sponsors, without whom we couldn't run this conference. We're still not financially profitable. ODSC as a conference overall, but not the India one. Uh, we, we probably will lose some money in this year's conference, which is perfectly fine. But uh, to a large extent, the sponsors reduce the damage for us. Uh, so we do need to thank our sponsors. We don't do much for the sponsors, as you would have seen. right? A lot of people came and said, this is, this is one of those conferences where we don't see a lot of marketing, right? Which is great for the attendees, not necessarily for the sponsors. But we still take the stand that, you know, this is not a conference where you're going to basically buy a speaking slot, right? You don't go sponsor and then you get 
a keynote slot. The three keynotes that we had, none of them were sponsors. Right? Did you guys enjoy the keynotes? They were absolutely people who deserve to be on the stage, not people who could buy their slots, right? Like that's, that's our philosophy. So uh, again, we want to thank our sponsors because they sponsored the conference even though they knew there is a, not a lot they will get out of it, all right? That's, that's again, like in the true spirit, they're trying to build this community. So uh, really want to thank them again, all right? Thank you. Sorry to keep you holding back. <laughs>